Welcome to part two of Antebellum Women, the lecture. We're now going to talk about some ideas about 19th century gender, gender ideology called the cult of true womanhood. So to do that, let's go to the next slide, shall we? Excellent. So the cult of true womanhood. And, and don't write down that one, two, three, four. Don't write those down because we're going to go through those one, two, three, four. Uh, but, but you can write the cult of true womanhood. And you can write that it is a 19th century gender ideology about how women were supposed to be. And, and, and what we're going to find out as we talk along that these ideas that, that his, and nobody in the 19th century called it the cult of true womanhood. This was invented by an historian, a historian of women named Barbara Welter in 1968, who, after looking at a lot of 19th century magazines, uh, uh, came up with this notion that there were all these cultural ideas that fell under these four categories. So uh, we're going to look at those one, two, three, four. Um, and what we're going to find as we listen, you listen to me talk, is that a lot of these ideas are still around today. That is the ways in which we understand women's roles and, and, and women's behavior today are in great part find their roots in these ideas born in the years right before the Civil War. So there you have it. Next slide. All right, so the first on that list was this notion that real women, nice women, good girls, uh, were supposed to be passive or submissive. Um, and then as we begin to get this 19th century notion that women were submissive to or passive to men. Now, this isn't to suggest, because we still had in our first few lectures when we're talking about coverture, which is fundamentally patriarchal, which is fundamentally about uh, uh, male power, We've always had, in the Western world at least, governed by coverture, a notion that women are secondary or passive to men. But rather what we begin to get in the 19th century is that women are naturally this way. So it's not that you have to be forced into it because the church elders will, will hang you as a witch, but rather that you're born this way, that you want to be this way, and that indeed in submitting to male authority, you find your true womanhood. You find your true happiness. So this notion, again, that women, so it's not just that women were supposed to be submissive, but we're changing how we think about it, that women like it, that, they, that, that this is how they express their womanhood. That this quote by this, this minister in the 1830s here, the power of a woman is in her dependence. A woman who gives up her dependence becomes unnatural. We, that is, we begin to get this sort of net sense that Martha Ballard, 19th century Americans, these ideas would have found Martha Ballard and her going about being a, a, a midwife, unsupervised by her husband, appalling. Um, though they would, they would have approved of the fact that she was nonetheless the wife and didn't have a lot of power in her family. Uh, but, um, and a word before we go on about, pre I should have a slide, but I don't prescriptive behavior and real behavior. I think there's a slide later on. Um, prescriptive behavior is a prescription. A prescription is what you're supposed to do. It's not what people really do. So all of these rules are about sort of rules about how people, how women were supposed to be. Now that's not to say they were really that way. And we're going to spend the second half of this slideshow talking about that. But I don't want you to think that somehow 19th century women were fundamentally different from you or me. People be people. Um, but the, the rules about womanhood began to change in the 19th century for some all sorts of reasons, having to do with industrialization, urbanization, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, next slide. Uh, thing number two on the list, that real women, true women, were pious or religious. And here we're talking about not just church, but rather this notion that somehow women were fundamentally more godly, more moral than men. I would argue we still think this. You hear this argument um, on occasion uh, that if women were ran things, if women were, were presidents and, 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 and we ran the government, that there'd be no more wars, there'd be no more violence. Gosh, I wish that was true. I don't think it is. I think that women be people and that we can be as douchey uh, as the next guy, quite literally. I do think we are socialized to be nicer and less aggressive. I don't think we're born that way. 
Um, but nonetheless, 19th century Americans believed that women were naturally born that way, made by God to be, to be better at right and wrong, better at being good, better at, at, at understanding the divine too. So all those things. Um, this will lead to, I, I don't have, I had some slides on female moral authority and I took them out because this lecture gets really long. Um, but female moral authority in shorthand is this 19th century notion that what women do is they take this rule, oh, we're supposed to be the naturally moral ones who are better at right and wrong. And a whole bunch of women will say, well, then we should, we should stop slavery. Or if we're good, we should have the right to vote so that the moral people are voting. Or if we're good, we should be able to tell people they can't uh, drink booze anymore. We, that is, you get women will then take this notion that they're better and they'll develop this female moral authority that will allow them to go out in public and engage in these social justice campaigns, anti-slavery, pro-women's rights, temperance campaigns, which are anti-alcohol campaigns, uh, anti-child -cruel cruelty uh, uh, organizations, anti child animal cruelty organizations. And so in this sort of notion that women are naturally more moral than men, a number of women, particularly middle class and upper middle class women who have the leisure time to do it, then use that to expand themselves into, into fundamentally political engagements in power, but political in the sense of outside of the establishment and outside of voting, right? Okay, next slide notion that women were naturally domestic. Now, in Martha Ballard's world and even before, women were still doing the housework and doing the child raising. The difference here, it isn't like suddenly somebody goes, oh, women should do the housework and raise the children, but rather they change the way they think about it in the same way that with the submissiveness, not just that women are submissive, but that you want to be submissive. You were born to be submissive. Hear this notion that real women were naturally domestic. They liked clean house. They liked to sew. They like to take care of babies, that God wanted them to do it and that they were naturally suited to it and that in doing these things you found your real achievement as a woman. Uh, there was, I, I always think whenever I give this lecture, when my kid was in high school and she was in music and I would sometimes have to do these volunteer things with the other orchestra moms and there was always a mom who felt the need to tell me that she was a full-time mom and it was the most important job in the world, and and et cetera, et cetera. And I was like, whatever, lady, I don't really care what you do. But I think she felt like, one, either challenged that I was a professor, or two, maybe just overly impressed with herself because she was a full-time mom. I don't know what it was. But but this sort of notion that full-time momming is, is the ultimate profession for women. I'm not saying it's not either. I'm just saying I think we should live in a world where we have a choice. I, for example, was not suited to being a full-time mom. I thought staying home with the kid was really, oh God, I hated it. Um, it was not for me. Uh, that is, but what we have here in 19th century notion is that you have to. That is what we say to women is you were made to do this. You don't have any choice. And if you're supposed to do this, then there's no point in going to college. You don't have to get a degree in English or history or or, in, or God forget, you know, any of the masculine professions because you're just going to be at home taking care of the children anyway. Next slide. And then we get the rise of these how-to manuals that tell women how to be domestic. Uh, this one here is Catherine Beecher's Treatise on Domestic Economy, which is essentially a book on how to do housework. There's seven pages of instructions on how to iron, you know, with a whole page of sort of the things you need to iron. And keeping in mind that you didn't just plug in the iron because the irons, you had to heat the irons up on a stove and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, pages on how to clean this and how to clean that and what to do with children with this and all that stuff. It's, it's a how-to manual on how to keep your house clean and your children on the straight and narrow. I, I could have just as well put up pictures of early cookbooks because it is in this same time period in the 1840s and 50s we get the very first cookbooks, mass-produced cookbooks for people. That is a notion that it wasn't like Martha Ballard just cooked stuff. She didn't have a cookbook. She wasn't watching Martha Stewart looking for uh, a cool new recipe for chicken. Um, she just cooked a chicken. 
um, begin to get this notion that that real women not only do the cooking, but that they're constantly searching for the right way or a better way to do it. And that's fine. I like a cookbook myself. But again, a notion that somehow it, it these books were clearly for women, not for men, and, and a notion that uh, it was women's job. But again, nobody thought of it as a job. If you were naturally born to do it, it's a calling. Ergo, it's okay that we don't pay you, and it's okay that we don't give you in. There's no public value on housework um, because you you were you were born to do it. So it's not a job. It's a calling. Yeah. Next slide. All right. So far, we have uh, our four rules. We had women are naturally are supposed to be naturally submissive or passive. Women are supposed to be uh, naturally morally superior and more religious than men. Women are supposed to be more domestic, uh, and, and, and they're supposed to totally dig uh, the process of both the housekeeping part of domesticity and the child-raising part of domesticity. And here, the fourth one, uh, the fun one, we're going to talk about sex now. So this was a cultural notion that women were supposed to be pure, purity, more sexually pure. Um, so remember 19th century, remember Martha Ballard in the previous century? There's a notion there really that women were lusty, that Sally Pierce wanted to have sex with Jonathan in the barn, that, that it was okay if at the little dance in the house everybody went out and about and was making out in the woods. That's okay. Um, it's fine. Because remember what I said, all cultures have rules about sex. And in Martha Ballard's world, the rules were you could have all the sex you wanted because people like to have sex, but if you got pregnant, you had to get married. What happens with the Industrial Revolution is it becomes impossible for cultures to force couples to marry. That is, in Martha Ballard's world, Jonathan Ballard needed, he had no place to go, and he needed to hang around and inherit his dad's farm so the culture could pressure him to marry Sally Pierce. In an industrializing world, in a urbanizing world in a world with westward expansion and railroads men could leave Jonathan Pierce could go to New York City and get a job in a factory he could get on a, 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 a train and go west that that is men could leave and yeah I guess women could leave too but the culture doesn't care about that because she's taking the baby with her and thus just moving the problem from one place to another so the rules about sexuality have to change in the 19th century because this culture has changed so drastically because of the Industrial Revolution. So that's interesting because I bet you when you learned about the Industrial Revolution in high school, nobody talked about how it changed the rules about sex and sexuality. So that's really interesting, isn't it? It is. Next slide. So what happens is gradually in the 1800s, the, the word goes out via magazines, from preachers, from a variety of sources, that women were not the lusty gender. You know, it was kind of like, remember how in your grandmother's time we thought, well, women like to have sex? Indeed, in colonial America, and all the way through Martha Ballard's time, there was a notion that a woman could not conceive unless she had an orgasm. So women's sexual pleasure was considered really important and an important part of a man's job. Um, but, but here we begin again in the 1800s, this notion that, that no, women don't like that. They don't want to do that. The women abhorred sex. That is, you can't just go, okay, because of industrialization and urbanization and factories and westward movement, uh, we're going to tell you women not to have sex because that's not going to work. So instead you tell women, you don't want to have sex. Nice girls don't. It's icky. Oh, it makes you feel dirty and bad and not in a fun way. So again, in this notion that real women, good women, uh, who were morally pure found sex repulsive and that, but also as the submissive gender and the domestic gender, they had sex only when they were compelled to uh, by their husband's needs or by their own personal or family maternal needs. That is the needs to have a kid. Next slide. Was that a real woman, a true woman, a good girl was pure two ways. Before marriage, she was pure by just avoiding sex. No sex for you. Do not touch the penis in any way. 
Um, so uh, we begin to get sort of a real emphasis on female premarital virginity. Um, and, and again, and the idea is that if you keep women from having sex before they're married, then you keep babies from happening before people are married, and then it's harder for men to leave once they're married. I don't know if that's strictly true, but that was, that was what they were trying to do there in the 19th century. And then after marriage, when a real woman got married, you would have to have sex occasionally. One, because you were married to a man and men are sexy beasts, um, but also because you would want to be a mother because, right, you were compelled to by nature or God. So a woman would have sex, but only with the greatest reluctance. So you would have sex as little as possible. And when you did, it would not be fun. It'd be bad. Um, and that women who found sexual pleasure were somehow suspect and wrong. Um, and, and, and again, also, the, masturbation just disappears from the culture for women. 19th century Americans were obsessed with male masturbation, super worried that men were masturbating too long and that too much and too long. Um, that's a whole different lecture that we won't have here. Um, but, but female masturbation became invisible because a culture that believes that women don't have sex or don't feel any sexual urges isn't going to even recognize that women might do that. So then what you might imagine what happens is that you've got all this notion that masturbation's a sort of invisible. That what? That doesn't happen. And that female sexual pleasure is suspect. And you combine those with the fact that still human beings are human beings. And you'd imagine the collision of those two things is shame and self-loathing for women. Uh, lots and lots of shame and self-loathing with regards to female sexuality. And, and, and I think we could all agree that in this country we're still struggling with all of those things. Right? Sure we are. Okay. All right. Next slide. What we're about to do is we're about to step into a world where we examine the difference between prescriptive and real behavior. So what we've been talking about, these rules about true womanhood, that true women are, are, are submissive, that true women are pure, that true women are domestic, that true women are, uh, are moral, uh, that's all prescriptive behavior. That is, it's the rules about how people should be. And, and, and there's lots and lots of prescriptive behavior rules. You should work hard. You should go to work. You shouldn't fake calling in sick. Um, you should, I guess, social distance when you go to Home Depot. Um, but also prescriptive behaviors would include also the gender rules, that women are supposed to be like this, that men are supposed to be like that. Okay. And what we know about those rules is different people follow them with different amounts of enthusiasm, and different people believe in them with, in, with different amounts of enthusiasm. So there's the rules, and then there's real behavior. What people really do, and the ways in which people resist the rules. All right? So for 19th century Americans, some of this stuff's really hard to track. It's hard to know how many women in their marriages were really submissive. One suspects no more than any other time, but nonetheless... Uh, but one of the things we can track is sexuality. And we can track sexuality with birth control. Next slide. It turns out, oh, and yeah, that's a condom. Just keep staring at it. Be appalled. Ooh, oh, Peg, why'd you show me that? Uh, you look at that and, and be horrified while I talk. Um, it turns out in the 19th century, there is a ton of birth control around. Now, most of it's not terribly effective. But for the purposes of this lecture and our needs to understand men and women in the 1900s, we don't care how well it works. We care that people are using it and that in using birth control, they are telling us two things about their lives. That one, they are trying to limit their fertility. That is, I don't want to have an unlimited number of babies. And it's one of the other things that urbanization gives us is that it's not helpful to have big families. It's helpful to have big families in small towns with farms because children are farm workers. But in big cities, it's not helpful. It's just more mouths to feed, more people to figure out how to educate and feed and clothe um, in increasingly small and cramped places. So 19th century Americans, as they urbanize, um, try to limit their fertility, and we begin family size shrinks. But also, birth control tells us that people were having 
brace yourself for what I'm about to say. <gasps> Recreational sex. Oh, sex for fun. And, and, and if you want to have sex for fun, but limit your fertility, you're going to need some way to keep the semen from meeting the eggs. Here we have a condom. They called these, the word for these, but you can see paragon sheaths. They were made uh, from sheep gut. Yes, the guts, the intestines of sheeps. Um, you would buy one and then you would soak it in warm water because it, you can tell it's every bit as dry and stiff as it looks in this picture. I'm talking about the condom, not the penis that will go in it. Um, and then um, um, you would soak it in warm water. It would soften up, use it, and then rinse it out, um, and then lay it down on a piece of toweling so that it dries out again, put it back in its box until the next time you need it. Yeah. You can imagine how well that worked. You know, that they broke, that they came off, that they cracked, that you forgot to warm it up before you got busy with your lady. Any number of things. Next slide. Cervical caps. Um, um, again, without spermicidal jelly, these did, didn't work all that well, even if you added lemon juice or vinegar. Uh, the idea was, though, that it would fit over your cervix. Tiny anatomy lesson. So if you imagine in your head a pear and then turn it upside down so that the fat part of the pear is up and the small part of the pear is down, that's kind of what a uterus looks like in a female part body. And the small part of the pear is the cervix that runs into the vagina. And the vagina is just the hallway the sperm go through to get to the cervical opening, which has got the opening into the uterus where the egg is like, hey, sperms, come see me. Um, so the idea was that if you could cover the cervix, um, um, you could keep sperm from getting into the uterus. And it's true, except that modern day we have these things called uh, diaphragms, and they look like cervical caps, only slightly different. Um, and, but you also have to use them in conjunction with spermicidal jelly because the sperms are super tiny and they can swim around these things. Um, but again, we don't really care how it worked or how it didn't work. And you would get these. You could buy them at pharmacies. You could get them from doctors. You could order them from advertisements in the back of magazines, etc. Hey, speaking of magazines, let's go look at the next slide. Turns out in the backs of magazines, you could also get all kinds of pills or sometimes bottles of tonic that were designed not so much to prevent uh, 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 pregnancy, but to make an early pregnancy go away. And if you're like, oh no, abortion, oh pig, it's the fifth rail, don't touch that. One, settle down. Um, and two, sorry, I get cranky about that stuff. Uh, two, um, 19th century Americans didn't consider a woman pregnant until she felt the baby move. Before that, you just had a stoppage. And it was considered perfectly acceptable to take pills or a tonic or to do something that unstopped your monthly stoppage. So indeed, in that very first ad, you see you can get these Portuguese female monthly pills, and what do they do? They ease stoppage or irregularity from whatever cause. Hmm. That is, in the second one, a certain cure for married ladies. Again, a notion that married ladies would be ladies who had sex, etc., etc. Um, um, and, and down here, in the third one, Dr. Corbett, he... Um, he helps married ladies with stoppage problems. So that might be pills, and it might be something a little more invasive than that. But here, uh, in the backs of magazines and, and newspapers, advertisements for taking care of those unwanted, we would see them as pregnancies. They would have just seen them as stoppages. That is, they... they what will happen is America is going to get really worked up about abortion. But for, for different reasons, and I'll, we'll talk about that eventually. I have a slide for that, so just settle down. Okay, next slide. So the, the douche, and here, look at that horrible apparatus. These were particularly popular in houses of prostitution because you could a lady could service a customer and then rinse out and then um, um, uh, go again, as it were. And the idea is that you had warm water maybe with some vinegar or lemon juice in the bucket uh, and you would put that up higher you would squat over this little buckety thing you know you got it okay and it turns out that 
that works somewhat. We know that women who worked in houses of prostitution got pregnant less often than, than, than women who didn't work in houses of prostitution. We also know that uh, in a world with lots and lots of STDs, that they probably also had enough uh, scarring on their reproductive systems that, I don't know, it gets complicated. But anyway, here's another way. And in some married women, you would have had a, a system like, you could have had a system like this at home for just rinsing out after sex to prevent pregnancy. Slide contraceptive sponges. Uh, we have these now, they're like more like menstrual sponges designed like a big tampon to soak up menstrual blood. But the notion was that you could soak this sponge, again, in lemon juice or vinegar or something, sometimes lye, which is really caustic, and you can imagine what that would do to your vaginal walls. And it's got a string on it, but you would soak this in something designed to kill sperm, and then you'd tuck that up inside your vag va vagina, up against the cervix, and so like the cervical cap, a way of keeping um, sperms out of your uterus. So, did it work? Eh, kind of. Kind of not. I don't recommend it um, unless you're using some sort of serious spermicide. Um, I do know that, that things like this work really, really well as in like essentially eternal, internal tampons. Um, you can buy things like this these days. Yeah. Okay, next slide. Here we have an IUD or an intrauterine device. Uh, 19th century Americans also called them pessaries. Um, you wouldn't buy this from the back of a magazine or, or at a farm. You would have to go to a doctor. And, and, and if you were a married lady and you already had some number of children that the doctor found acceptable, like you'd had three or four and he thought that's, he agreed with you that that was enough, you, he could put one of these things inside your uterus. I like the, this one because it looks like a tiny TV antenna to me, which makes me laugh. Um, but um, we still use IUDs in America today. Some people do, but we usually use ones that are also in, sort of impregnated, as it were, with spermicide or some kind of birth control thing, so they're emitting stuff. These, the idea is you just put this foreign object inside your uterus, and it sufficiently irritated the uterine lining so that while sperms could get in there and fertilize eggs, eggs couldn't plant because this thing was roughing up the inside of the uterus. So you'd imagine um, and these things caused a fair bit of uterine scarring and that doctors were loath to put one in a woman unless she'd had the baby she wanted to have because often after wearing, or wearing's not the right word, but having an IUD for a number of months or years, a lady's uterus would be sufficiently scarred that she couldn't have babies anymore anyway. So, uh, is this a safe thing to do? Not particularly, uh, but it does suggest, one, uh, how desperate some women were to limit their fertility or to quit having babies. A and also, um, again, a thing people did suggesting the space between, next slide, between prescriptive behavior and real behavior. That is, again, my point with all this birth control stuff, on top of it just being super interesting, right, is that, that, that there's a, we, can, we can know for a fact there's a wide gap for 19th century Americans between the prescriptive women should be pure and not have sex and not enjoy it, and the real behavior because there's all this birth control. And that then also suggests to us that um, it's probably true with the other prescriptions, you know, that real women yearn to be submissive, that real women uh, 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 yearn to be more religious and moral, or just are, or that real women yearn to be domestic in both the housekeeping and child caring way. We can guess that. Some of it we can't know for sure, but one of the things you do when you're a historian, and we all kind of are now temporarily, if you're listening to this slide, you're a you're a part-time historian. That's one of our jobs, is to take it take guesses about the past, but not just wild-ass, random, you know, I'm the president and I just make shit up guesses, but rather informed guesses based on all the other stuff we know because we've studied this part of the American past. So...
lots of birth control suggests that maybe not so much actual belief in purity. But nonetheless, the ideas are out there, and they're still out there today, and that's interesting. Now, next slide, we're going to talk about something controversial, and you're just going to have to suck it up. Okay? Okay, next slide. Talk briefly about abortions because we were talking about birth control, and indeed we kind of already did talk about abortions because anytime I guess you interfere with an already fertilized egg, I guess that's technically an abortion. Um, 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 Madame Restelle was one of 200 abortion providers in New York City in the 1800s. Indeed, Madame Restelle set up these clinics where ladies could go to get their stoppages unstopped. And first she had a clinic in New York and she was so popular that as so many women came to see her that then she opened up a second one and then she couldn't work at all of them. So one of the things she did is she franchised uh, Madame Restelle's clinics. And indeed she invented the notion of franchising your business. So these abortion clinics were America's first franchise. And again 19th century Americans didn't consider it abortion for a very long time because until you felt the baby move around, nobody considered the baby real. It wasn't really a baby. I'm going to be super honest. I don't think it's really a baby until it can survive on its own. Um, if, if it can come out of me and it can be fine on its own, well, not on its own, not like, you know, going to the grocery store, then I think it's a baby. Until then, it's, it's a thing that mommy has made. But nonetheless... What will happen is that the member, and I told you medical doctors back Martha Ballard's world, nobody took doctors very seriously, and certainly with regards to women's health, particularly reproductive health, uh, doctors weren't particularly skilled or trusted. Um, so what will happen is in the 1900s, at, sort of the, at about the time Martha Ballard died in 1812, uh, doctors, they'll start to open up medical schools and then they'll start to graduate all these doctors, but now these doctors all need work. Um, so the, in an effort to convince Americans that doctors are medical professionals they should use, they professionalize. So they have colleges, and they say this is a really important thing, they get you to, con you know, to be convinced that being a doctor is a really important thing and not a skeevy and dubious thing. Um, and, and then to get business, one of the very first things they do is they get into women's reproductive health because women have babies and that's a, that's, a, that's a guaranteed income. So what they do is they run all the midwives out of the business um, by criminalizing midwifery, criminalizing women having anything to do with this. And, and the other thing they do is they get really involved in criminalizing abortion. That is, they sell to Americans a notion that abortion is bad. And they don't do it because they think it's bad. This isn't, you know, there's nothing in the Bible about abortion. They do it, the medical profession, the American Medical Association does it purposely in the 1830s and 1840s so that they can run uh, uh, midwives who are both helping deliver babies and helping unstop stoppages and all the Madame Restelles. They're trying to drive all those people out of business so that men can go into the business of women's health. And so the criminalization of abortion and the selling to America and this notion that it's really bad is a campaign engaged by the medical profession to expand their economic power. That's all it is. And here's the thing I'm going to say, and I know that some of you listening to this uh, 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 are uh, uh, anti-abortion. I'm not going to say you're pro-life because I don't believe in such a thing. 90% of the people who are so-called pro-life in America are also pro-death penalty. So I don't think, there. I think pro-life is a bullshit title we give to it to disguise what it really is, which is anti-woman. I think if you're anti-choice and anti-woman, that's your call. But the reality is the only way to be truly free is to, be, is to own your own body. The very essence of slavery is that somebody else controls and owns your own body. And for women, because we make human beings, the only way for us to be truly free is to control our own bodies. So, being pro-choice is about being pro-women being able to control their own bodies. And I think that's really, really important. And I think we get it all mixed up with all this sort of political and religious other stuff that disguises what we're really talking about, which is the control of female bodies. Don't like abortion? Don't get one.
but you shouldn't be able to tell other women what to do with their bodies. You shouldn't. And we shouldn't pretend this is about life when almost all of the anti-abortion people are pro-death penalty. It's not about that. It is fundamentally about the control of the female body. And you can think however you want to feel about that, and you can disagree with me all you want, but I want you to be really, really clear about what you're doing there when you're thinking about that. Being anti-choice is about being anti-woman. That's all there is to it. So you make that choice based on that. And you do what you do, and you, I'm not the boss of you. But know this, for much of world history, and for much of American history, nobody thought anything of a woman deciding to end a pregnancy. It's a fairly new phenomenon. And that's worth, that's worth knowing. Remember we talked last week about how you know, we have all these imaginary things we think about the past? This business about Americans never did this is another imaginary thing. Lots of people did it. And a world, you don't get any reliable birth control in America until 1962 with the invention of the pill. Before that, there's lots of pregnancies people don't want. And, and the people who can afford to and the people who know how make them go away. And they always have. And they always will. You can like it or not like it. But you, women should be able to control their bodies. I'm trying to imagine a world where we have laws about what men could do their bodies. Can you imagine that world? Because I can't. Anyway, next slide. We're about done. Bye. No, no bye. Next slide. I end here uh, uh, with this slide, which is where I ended the first half, too. Uh, but I end with this slide, uh, one, because I think that's a really cool picture. Remember we talked about fashion, look at all the layers and stuff. Uh, but also they look just kind of sad and depressed. It suggests slavery there. Um, but, but also, next week our lecture is going to be about slavery. So tonight, today what we were really doing was talking about middle class and elite class women. Next week we're going to talk about slavery. And um, then I have a lecture down the pike a little bit that's about working women where we'll talk about sort of poor working class factory women. So really what tonight was about was not to, even about middle class and elite class women, but sort of about sort of what are the rules that we set up in the 19th century that, that literally everybody has to contend with one way or another for the rest of American history. And, and again, establishing these rules aren't that these rules are born of the Industrial Revolution and the realities of the Industrial Revolution. And, and, and really, that means they're not that old, which is interesting, isn't it? Yeah, I think so, too. Well, I hope you had fun. I hope you don't have nightmares with scary uh, uh, sheep's got condoms in them. Ah! Uh, but anyway, that was good. Send me your notes. Thank you. Keep up the good work. I'm proud of you. I still miss you. Bye.